Hello everyone and welcome to American Civil War and UK History channel on YouTube and you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram and all the links will be below and if you're new make sure you subscribe and also it will be available as a podcast so we do have a slideshow that goes with this if you want to see the slideshow pop over to the YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch it as a video. This is the English Civil War series so this is my third video about the English Civil War and Today is the anniversary of the Battle of Naseby, one of the most important battles in British history on English soil. And here to explain the battle for us is Mike Ingram. And Mike is a historian, author, and runs several organisations involved in battlefield preservation here in England, one being Naseby 1645. Hello, mate. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. So the Battle of Naseby 1645. So what is going on? in England at this point in English Civil Wars, and how do we get to Naseby? Right. Um, it's confused as it always is um, during this period. Um, the parliamentarians are control of the North. Um, I suppose the Royalists are, are pretty much in control of, of most of the centre of the country and a good part of the South. Um, there is a siege going on down down at the south, uh, which is obviously um, causing some concern for, for Parliament. The King is still based uh, pretty much around Oxford. Uh, Oxford's his headquarters. Uh, the par Parliament uh, has ordered the change in the army. It's, it's really started uh, with what's known as the, the self-denying ordinance, uh, which is put forward by a gentleman by the name of Zeus Tate, who incidentally also comes from Northampton, which is uh, 12 miles away from Naseby. So it, it, it's, all, it's all very connected. Um, so that, that happened. And as a direct result of that, um, we get the new model army formed, uh, which is the, the first, I suppose, professional army in England. It was called the new modelled army because it's a new design. Um, the, it's uh, detractors, which was royalist and parliamentarian um, as well. They called it the new nodled army because they didn't think it was going to work. Having this one unified army um, that, that, that centralised rather than a whole series of smaller armies that are that are county based i suppose uh, so nobody was sure it was going to work but one of the big problems that parliaments had had with their army up until this point was that um, a lot of its commanders were politicians and not really soldiers so what the one thing that the um, self-denying ordinance does means that you had to be in the army by merit and, and that was quite a key quite a key thing to it and and even at, when it happens uh, Cromwell actually um, loses his position as a consequence of it so everybody who's fighting uh, on the parliament side are the soldiers basically so they form the new model army up down in, in London um, at, at Windsor and their first task is given to march down to Taunton to relieve to relieve the siege that's going on there. So the new model army starts marching out from London. Uh, it marches all the way down to the south. It gets as far as Blandford Forum, um, which is central southern half of England. Uh, and the uh, parliament decides that they no longer want them to do that. So they then marched them back up to Oxford and they're given the instructions to lay siege to Oxford. However, uh, when they get to Oxford, they find that somebody, as typical with committees, has forgotten to order uh, the siege equipment. So they, they stood around Oxford for, for a little while. And then uh, in the meantime, while this is going on, uh, the King uh, and Prince Rupert, they all leave Oxford and they head north. So we don't know 100% what their intentions were. 
but very probably it was to relieve some of the sieges that were going on uh, in the north of England uh, and possibly try and recapture the north of England for, for the king. So they have left Oxford. Parliament lays siege to, um, uh, to Oxford for a short while. And then they get given the instruction. I'm going to, <coughs> excuse me, hay fever. Um, that they uh, they're given the instruction to go after the king. So they leave Oxford and start marching north to find the new model to find the the royalist army. The royalist army is um, gathering because what, when the king leaves uh, Oxford, he only leaves with a very small army. Um, Rupert himself has gone into uh, into into Wales to recruit. Bernard Astley is also recruiting Fort. So they all meet uh, in north of the Midlands uh, to join up and presumably to carry on to go north. While this is happening and you've got the issues going on around Oxford, um, they, the, the King decides to try and draw the Royalist Army, um, the Parliamentarian Army, away from uh, Oxford. Because uh, it under siege for a couple of weeks, so they they've almost run out of supplies and uh, and all the things that go with being caught under a siege. Uh, so the king decides to turn back, and they lay, lay siege to Leicester to try and draw the parliamentarian army away, which of course they they did, and they were doing that anyway. So they come away to um, to Leicester. The um, parliamentarian army starts to continue moving north um, but what they do is they move from from parliamentarian garrison to parliamentarian garrison uh, and they stay pretty much out the way and this is one of the big problems that the royalists have uh, particularly through this campaign is that their intelligence is appalling and they don't actually know what's going on uh, for even actually up until the day of the battle, they're not certain what's happening. Um, so they continue to go, they, they lay siege to Leicester. Uh, they then move down to Market Harbour and start to ravage the countryside all around Market Harbour. Actually, on at least three occasions, they go right down to Northampton and um, threaten the town of Northampton, who is petrified at this point um, that they're going to do the same to Northampton that they've done to Leicester. Uh, and completely sack the town. But they don't, they collect up all the supplies. Uh, and of course, with Oxford being incredibly short of supplies after the siege, uh, they collect up thousands of cattle and sheep. Uh, the king then moves to Market Harbour down to Daventry, uh, and they get down to Daventry, and then uh, winning five in every troop of cavalry take all the supplies down to, down to Oxford. And again, while this is all going on, the, king, the parliamentarian army is moving slowly and very deliberately north. Uh, when they get to, um, can't remember whether it's Newport, Pagnall or Stony Stratford, um, but Fairfax, who's obviously in command of the, um, of the new model army, sends back to, um, back to London, to parliament, tells them that they need Cromwell, although, He's over in the Huntingdon Peterborough area, and so he's summoned immediately to uh, join up with the, with the new model army. So that's all going on there. Um, the king stays at Daventry during this time, and it's uh, the inn that he stayed at uh, is still there, the wheat sheaf, and the main part of the army stayed on, on Borough Hill which is an ancient Iron Age hill fort and very huge commanding uh, all around the landscape, all around it. So that happens. In the meantime, uh, Parliament, the parliamentary army has reached Northampton. So they, stay, they spend a couple of days at Northampton getting ready. Um, the Royalist army then leaves Daventry and starts heading back to Market Harbour. All this time, the Royalist Army still doesn't know that the Parliamentarian Army is literally biting their heels. Um, and so they, they get up to their, the, the, 
the new model army leaves Northampton and marches north, shadowing the Royalist army on the inside. They get to the inside, um, the, new, the new model army gets to a, a village called Gillsborough. Um, the king and his army is at Market Harbour and um, a, a place called Great Glen, which is, which is just outside. Uh, and from there, they start sending out patrols. So we, we're now the night before the battle. Um, the patrols go out. One of them gets, as they're, they're all over, the patrols are over the whole area. One of those patrols gets to Naseby. Uh, and uh, it's almost certainly Prince Rupert's lifeguard. And they stop at Naseby. Um, and of course, Gillsborough is only a few miles, five miles from um, from Naseby. So the parliamentarians also send out patrols and one of the parliamentarian patrols clatters into Naseby, finds the Royalist and, and at this point again, and I can't overemphasize this enough, the Royalist had got no idea that the parliament was there and that close. So um, most of the Royalists are captured uh, in, in this process they a um, couple of them managed to escape and get back to Market Harbour and basically you can imagine the chaos that ensued um, do you realize that the, the parliamentarian army is is miles away from us a few miles away from us um, so the alarm is sounded at Market Harbour the the parliamentarian army uh, Royalist army is assembled and they march out south uh, to a place called East Farndon uh, where they assemble and they uh, that they they seem to have had um, a pre-planned battle order uh, and that becomes important in a, in a moment so they've got their pre-planned order they, they set up on the ridge the the parliamentarian army leaves Gillsborough comes through Naseby uh, and sets up where the the obelisk is today uh, which was the site of a windmill during the time so they form up there uh, Fairfax and Cromwell move forward uh, to the edge of the, the opposite ridge and between them they decide that it is far too a good defensive position. So from that defensive position they decide to move to better ground to fight the battle on. So they then move across to the other side of, Daven of, of Naseby from where to fight the battle from. Uh, Rupert sends out uh, a chap named Reese, Roos, um, the master of horse, and even at that point he cannot tell where the parliamentarian army is, but they're eventually seen moving across the countryside, and uh, Prince Charles, um, sorry, King Charles, and uh, a chap named Digby, who is his, uh, one of the most important and influential courtiers, um, says, that, says to the king, look, they're running away from you, we need to go after them. So the whole army moves to where they can see the Parliament army is, is moving to. Um, they do have the advantage that as well at this point that they've got the wind behind them, so that will blow the smoke into the faces of the parliamentarian troops rather than the other way. Um, so the, the two sides move off to fight each other, they form upon the on a new pair of ridges uh, and, and at Dust Hill. Um, yeah, so that brings you to the point of, of the okay. battle starting. Well, thank you. So for those that don't know, what is an English Civil War army made up of? Um, okay, um, you would normally have two wings of cavalry, um, depending on the number, um, about a thousand, between a thousand and two thousand on each side. Mm -hmm. So that you have the, the cavalry on each wing with there. In the centre, you then have the infantry. Uh, and then you will then it, but but that's that's the very basic setup because there are variations in the army. So for example, the Royalist army, uh, with it, on its cavalry wings, um, you've got on the right wing Prince Rupert and Prince Morris. Um, and as well as the cavalry, they have around 200 embedded musketeers with them. Okay. And, uh, and and that's the same on, on both flanks. So Marmaduke Langdale, who's on the other flank, he has 
around 200 musketeers mixed in. And then in the center of the Royalist Army, you've got Jacob Astley. He has around three and a half thousand foot and he has around 800 horse mixed in with him. So it, it's a combined arms army. Uh, whereas the, the, the parliamentarian army, the new model army, um, doesn't have that. They, they don't have the, the mixing in. They keep them in, in separate lines and separate formations. So you have um, uh, Oliver Cromwell on the right wing with around 4,000 cavalry. In the centre, you have the infantry under Major General Philip Skippen. He has around 6,400 foot uh, with him. On the left wing is uh, Commissary General Henry Ireton with around 3,300, 3, 3,500 cavalry. But then they also have a third organisation, which are the Dragoons. The Dragoons are not like the later Dragoons like you see with the, with the French during the Napoleonic Wars. These are purely infantry who ride to battle on horses. So once they get to where they're going to fight, they get off the horses and fight on foot as musketeers. So they're, they're, they're like a, um, a mobile force. Okay. So you've got those. And then also on the, uh, part on, the, on the new model army side, they have around 11 cannons with them. Uh, the Rawdists don't have any cannons. And I'll explain that in, in a moment. Okay. So that, that's roughly how an army or, or yeah. the armies are lined up. Okay. So let's have a look at the like again. Look at the royalist uh, lineup. So uh, you have. Uh, so please explain the uh, the royalist uh, who's in command. Sorry. Okay. So so the royalist uh, officially, obviously, it's going to be Charles the first who's uh -huh. who, who's in command. Um, however, in practice, it is actually Prince Rupert is the commander of the army. So so he's he's the one who's in charge. Uh, and his brother Morris as well is very much involved in that. So you've got that going on on that side. Um, so you've got Charles there on your image. The next one along is is Prince Rupert. Um, he is the nephew of Charles I. The third one along um, is um, Marmaduke Langdale, who's the commander of the Northern Horse, um, who had come all the way down from Yorkshire to take part in this battle. Uh, apparently he was a very dour sort of person. Um, incidentally as well, because I, I think it does have a bit of a bearing on the battle, uh, Langdale's men had threatened to mutiny while they were up in Leicester um, because they wanted to go back to their homes because it was um, getting into the, um, the season of, of the harvesting. And then the, the final one on your, on your image there, that's Bernard Astley, who's the commander of the foot. And he's been fighting since the very beginning of the war. Um, so he's a very experienced general oh, and a very experienced commander. Okay, let's have a look at the parliament. So who we've got in charge in the parliament? Okay, so at the top corner there, we've got Thomas Fairfax, uh, who's in command of the army. Um, then next to him is obviously Oliver Cromwell. Although, as I said, he doesn't really get involved until right in the last minute before the battle starts or, or the day before the battle starts. Uh, and then you've got Harry, Henry Ireton underneath Fairfax, um, who's the commander of the other wing of the cavalry. And then next to him, um, you've got Philip Skippen, who's the commander of the infantry. Okay. So that gives you your sides. So how good a how good a cavalry commander was oliver cromwell just out of oh that they they were probably uh cromwell's cavalry were probably the best cavalry in england yeah uh, and they they were known as the iron sides because they were that good um a lot of people get their history mixed up because obviously we know that oliver cromwell was uh you know the main man in charge but as far as the army was concerned Fairfax is the army commander, isn't it? Yes, so that's it. Yeah. I don't want people to get confused. You know, Oliver Cromwell is in charge of sort of the parliament, but he's well, he's he's not parliament. even that at this point. Yeah. He's oh, just, really okay. He's just a colonel in the army. Okay. Admittedly, he's a good one, yeah. and he just commands the right wing. And how does he end up in the role of of, of a cavalry commander? Is he? Um, he, he 
going right back to the to, to more or less to the beginnings of the Civil War, um, he's had a troop of cavalry, uh, and over time he grows it. Um, they become more disciplined. He trains them better, uh, and so they grow to be a, I suppose, a, a better army. Okay. So we get to the morning of the battle. So June the thirteenth, sixteen forty-five. June, yeah. No, well. Uh, we, June the 13th, the day before, so the actual day of the battle yeah, sorry, is June. 14th, sorry, apologies. Um, so please tell us how the battle starts on the morning of the 14th, June, and how it plays out. Okay, so um, it starts, we spoke about um, the, the parliamentarian dragoons, um, which are under a chap named John Oakey. Cromwell, uh, they're attached to Cromwell. Com Cromwell then sends them round to the flank to... Um, to what's known as Solby Hedge. Um, you have to remember that at the time of the battle, all these fields are open. They're, they're all open fields. Um, the only hedge um, is what Solby Hedge, and that's actually a parish boundary. Um, it, it's, it's a high hedge uh, and it's a very thick hedge. So the dragoons go up um, along the line of there, yeah, as your, your image there. Uh, line against that, that hedge, that's still the ancient hedge that was there at the time of the battle. Uh, and then they start to attack uh, or fire into Rupert's flank uh, as part of it. Um, and that, whether it was part of the plan all along or whether it was the fire from the Dragoons that forces the battle to start, but the battle, it starts about 10 a.m. with Rupert's cavalry or Morris's cavalry uh, charging off from that position uh, and charging down towards Henry Ireton. Um, where we were talking about the, uh, the troops, uh, Ironside's, um, Cromwell's troops and Ireton's troops were very disciplined um, and they worked close together. And it's not as you see in the films. Um, it is a very slow, very deliberate forward movement with the cavalry thigh to thigh. So I don't think of it as, as a wild charge. It's, it's very slow and very deliberate. Pistols come out at the last minute, swords come out at the last minute. Uh, and that happens down in the uh, in, in the middle of the battlefield. So what sort of damage does that um, manoeuvre from the hedge actually do to the Royalist army? Does it, does it really damage? Um, we, we, we know it does cause some damage and we, knew, we know that people were died as a consequence of it. Um, but the main thing seems to take place further down uh, in the bottom of the battlefield. Okay. Um, and um, Rupert sweeps away half of the parliamentarian cavalry not all of it any only half yeah. of it so it has sort of like a, an impact at the beginning and then it just sort of dies itself out well it, it carries on because yeah. um uh, once you start moving the cavalry you've then got to start moving the infantry yeah. and the cavalry on the other side otherwise you get exposed flanks and it's it's not good for fighting no so yeah. as you can see in the see in your image there so you've got the reserve is staying back. Rupert goes in towards Ireton, pushes half of Ireton's troops away. Uh, now, the other thing as well, which is, which is sort of, you can see from the map, um, what uh, Fairfax did was that he kept his infantry over the brow of a, of a hill, over the brow of the ridge, very much in the same way as um, Wellington does at Waterloo. Uh -huh. It's a very similar technique. So Parliament, um, the Royalists don't actually see the fall of the army. Now, why they did that is unclear. It's quite possible that it was done because um, the Parliamentarian army was pretty much raw recruits. Um, they had experienced officers, but a lot of the men were quite raw recruits. Whereas the King's army um, has been fighting all the way through the war. So they're, they're really battle hardened. Uh -huh. uh, in comparison. So he, he might have actually done that to hide um, uh, to hide uh, the, the troops 
so they're not afraid, um, et cetera, et cetera. So then the infantry move forward. Um, Prince Rupert, and, and again, this is one of the big downfalls of the battle, um, is Prince Rupert and his cavalry keep going. In very probably, uh, if, if you look, where you can see on your map that it says Parliamentary Army, that's the top of the ridge there. Yep. Um, and Prince Rupert's favourite manoeuvre would be to charge down that flank, turn round the back, and come up round the rear. But what he doesn't realise is that Parliament's army is actually down in that gap he wants to come through. Okay. So he, he can't charge down the back. So instead, he keeps going down, down the flank, down towards where they're on the map. You can see there the sign that's saying the Battle of Naseby. So it travels down, they, they travel down that thing. And so the commander of the army is effectively off the battlefield. So there's no one actually in command uh, as such, which makes life even more complicated. Mm -hmm. So while that's going on, uh, and, in, and in actual fact, the, the infantry come into contact. And to start with, the King's army has the advantage and it start, they start to push um, the, the um, parliamentarian infantry back in the center. Um, but it doesn't go back in a straight line, it actually pivots. Um, Fairfax's uh, own regiment of foot, which is on the far right hand side uh, of the infantry there. Um, that more or less stays where it is, but the other side is hit very hard. Uh, and they suffer quite badly and so they start to pull back. But because um, the uh, parliamentarian army has got the line of reserves, um, they don't buckle and flee the battlefield. They just go behind the, the, the ones that are broken, go behind the reserves and the reserves go in to fill that, that space. And can I just ask about what, what sort of fighting are we talking about when, when you have uh, from pikemen, you know? Yeah. Um, well, it, it's pikemen don't forget are there just to protect from cavalry. Mm -hmm. that, that's their main role. Um, and it's the musketeers who supposedly do the damage but it's quite a steep slope from from dust hill across Boardmore and back up the other side so we know from contemporary accounts that the uh, royalist musketeers only fire off one volley uh, one continuous volley uh, when they get to the top uh, and they then go to hand to hand which will be for the musketeers they'll be either using their tucks their short swords uh, or turning the muskets around and using them as clubs. Uh -huh. um, so, so that goes along that line, basically. Uh, and the, the pikemen will be doing push of pike as well, but the, their numbers are limited because you'll also have the pikemen on the other side. In fact, we know that Henry Ireton, um, he's, he's still on the battlefield and he turns in quite early on in this stage against the infantry and attacks with his remaining cavalry um, Astley's foot in the flank uh, and during that he gets badly wounded and he gets a, a pike through the thigh uh, as part of it so we know we know we know that's going on there um, the parliamentarian army holds their line uh, and while all this is going on you've then got Cromwell with his cavalry, um, he he only deploys the front line, uh, his, his first line of, of cavalry. They're also got a very good defensive position um, because they're across a rabbit warren. So a rabbit warren means that you can't charge. It's a slow, deliberate move and they move forward. Uh, and Langdale and Cromwell's cavalry meet in the bottom of Broadmoor, uh, directly in front. Uh, and uh, to say the morale of Langdale's, troop, Langdale's troops are not strong, so they, they break um, after a short time of fighting. Um, Cromwell also suffers at that time. Uh, he gets captured and has to get rescued again by his own men, which they do, uh, and he loses his hat as well oh. um, as part of this. So 
um, his first line then chased Langdale off. Now there's, there's another another part of all of this uh, and it's it's not on your map in fact it's not on many maps at all to be honest um, is while all this is going on there is a third force uh, of around 500 cavalry which are led by someone named Sir John Norwich. Sir John Norwich is the um, in charge of Rockingham Castle, which is about six miles to the uh, to the north northeast, uh, and he has been shadowing the king the whole time. So at this point, then he could uh, because everything hasn't got to the battlefield yet. People are still getting arriving at the battlefield while all this is going on. Because you remember right back at the beginning, and I said that when they formed up at East Farndon, they formed up in battle formation. Well, when they moved, they moved in battle formation, which is why the formations are as they are, um, why there is no cannons on the Royal side, because they're still on the way. And they would have moved from East Farndon um along in that route and and another thing that's also quite key forgive me for, for not mentioning it um also quite key to this whole story is ridge and furrow uh, are you familiar with ridge and furrow no ridge and furrow is the medieval 17th century farming method uh -huh. where you get uh, because plows are wooden plows and not the modern plows that we have now uh, they only have one blade, which effectively pushes the soil upwards in one direction. Mm -hmm. So with your ox or your horse, you go forward, it pushes the earth up on one side, they then turn around and come back, and it pushes the earth up on the other side. So effectively you get a mound, and <coughs> excuse me, you get a whole field of strips, which are up to a metre high running down the battlefield now horses won't go across ridge and furrow uh -huh. because it's too high so they go along the ridge and furrows and it's the same with the infantry to keep going up and down every meter every three foot uh is really difficult so they travel along the lines and this battlefield is very much set up for that and in fact there are quite a few parts of it where the original furrow still survives. Uh -huh. So it's guiding both armies along these lines. Um, so you've got that. And then, so there is literally only one road. You can see it on your map from Clipston to Sibertoft. Uh -huh. That is literally a single track and it has got ridge and furrow at 90 degrees to the road all the way along. So you can't move alongside the road you've got to use the track of the road only um, which slows them down so what we think happens is that the baggage train um king's budget train is actually just outside clipston uh -huh. they, they form up outside clipston and uh, sir john norwich's cavalry attacks them in the rear and defeats or stops the cannons getting to the battlefield plus a lot of other stuff as well so really lack of, um, like you were saying earlier, lack of, uh, you know, knowing about where the enemy is costs the Royalists this battle really, doesn't it? Oh, it does. Yeah, it's poor intelligence and the fact that Rupert goes off gallivanting. Yeah. So Rupert goes off gallivanting. So what does he actually go and do in the end? Because he comes he comes up against the parliamentarian baggage train in part or some of his men yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and they attack the baggage train. Uh -huh. So this is that's the parliamentarian baggage train. The yeah. image you've got here is the king's baggage train. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, which which they capture, yeah, uh, at the end of the battle. So what 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 are they taking when they? What is the thinking behind attacking the baggage train? I, I mean, leaving the battlefield is just you know I can't you know can't understand it. But, yeah. You know. Um. Ba basically, um. You well, he should have been should have left the baggage train alone to be honest. Um, and should have gone after them, uh, gone after the infantry. But he goes off and does that. I mean, some of his cavalry um, chase some of Ariton's cavalry all the way back to Northampton, which is 12 miles. Okay. So that, that doesn't help it at all either. 
so you've got all this going on as i say um with, with the various parts of it um you've got them attacking from the rear now we spoke about cromwell with his um two lines or three lines of of cavalry he's only sent his first line uh to deal with langdale at this point then he turns the remainder of his cavalry in sideways and attacks skippen's infantry in the side uh, and really we sort of start to get to the point where the i suppose the battle is lost yeah uh you can't do a lot more about it no um Oakish Dragoons come and join in the battle uh, as well from the rear. So it's pretty much the King's Army's beaten at this point. Uh, they uh, they stop. And, and it, again, this, this is quite a key moment for how things happen. Um, Fairfax orders his infantry and his cavalry that are there, although we've got some of them gone, uh, to stay where they are and reform before they go after them which effectively allows the king to escape the battle or partially escape the battle. And this is a big blow for the Royalists um, war, really, isn't it? This battle. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there are 5,000 prisoners taken. Yeah. Um, but only about a thousand Royalists killed. So they don't really actually recover from this one. No. No, uh, and they, they cannot form up again. Astley es escapes mm -hmm. and, and has a a last fling at Stow at the Wold. Okay. And what happens to Charles I? Where does he go from this? Well, uh, in the immediate aftermath, uh, he wants to turn and fight again. Um, the Earl of Cornthorpe says, basically, he says, don't be a prat. Yep. Grabs him by the, the bridle and starts to lead him off. Now, you can't quite see it on, on your map, but at the very top of the picture, there is a place called Moot Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is probably a last stand at Moot Hill with the king. Okay. Yeah. Um, we found lots of musket balls. Uh, did all in did there. the Parliament army try and capture the king, maybe? Was that a plan? No, be, because they, they were ordered to wait. Yeah, okay, they did. And, and the king was on his horse. He, he had long gone by the time. Mm -hmm. Although um, it pretty much limits where the king can go. Yeah. Uh, because of it so with the fact that um you've got parliamentarian cavalry from rockingham all around clipston and all around that area plus cromwell's front line of cavalry the king can't really go off that way so the only way he can go is more or less in a straight line through the middle of the battlefield through sibertoff direction uh and although nobody actually says the exact route the king takes um I'm pretty certain that he would have gone um, through Lebanon Old Hall, crossing the Welland at, at Lebanon Old Hall, uh, where the king had stayed the day, the night before the battle, uh, and um, escaped when well, he goes up to Leicester, and then he continues north, uh, where he's eventually captured. Okay, and uh, so he doesn't get to chat to um, to Rupert afterwards, because that might have, that would have been an awkward conversation, wouldn't it? It would have been, uh, but Rupert does actually come back right at the end. We talked about that um, skirmish at Moot Hill. Yeah. Um, it's very probably about that point where he does return. Um, but um, Charles is really unhappy with him. Oh, okay. And Rupert writes his, his memoirs. Yeah. He, he more or less sacks Rupert. Yeah, I would have loved that. I mean, he left uh, him. Yeah, uh, completely exposed, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, mate. So thanks for explaining the battle, but we're going to move on to yourself now because you, you, you're a historian and you are an author and you're involved in a lot of stuff. So you're involved in um, a lot of bat battlefield preservation in Northampton area, Northamptonshire. Yeah. Uh, you've got a Facebook page. Um, well, two. I think you've got a Facebook group and a Facebook page. Is that correct? So you've got Naseby 1645. Uh, actually three. So I, I'm, I'm the current yeah. chair of Naseby 1645. Yeah. Okay. I'm also chair of the Northamptonshire Battlefield Society. Mm -hmm. I've also got my own page, of course, as, as an author in my own right. Yep. Uh, and then I'm also very much involved in the Northampton Civic Society. Cool. And um, so, yeah, so you also um, have written books as well as articles for magazines since the yeah. 80s. Yeah, so, yeah. Tell us all about that. 
Yeah, um, obviously the um, my very my my earlier books. I wrote a book on the the German MP40 submachine gun. Mm -hmm. um, then I wrote uh, my Bosworth book. Um, then I did uh, the 1460 Battle of Northampton. Uh, then uh, the two Bosworth book. Then, then the second Bosworth book. The first book, the first Bosworth book, is very basic. Whereas the second one, Richard III and Battle of Bosworth, is a lot more detailed. Yeah. Uh, and looks at the campaign in a lot more detail. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've written the book with Graham Evans, uh, a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, on all the battles and the battlefields, which is also got the chapter, um, two chapters on Naseby, in it, which you showed in the previous one, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so that's it. That's what I do. I'm also a, a freeman of the borough of Northampton mm -hmm. um, for, for what I do. So, yeah, that's so, it, really. So, so also, and again, you give, tour, you give tours of the battlefield and... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I, I do well, lots yeah. of tours. Yeah, um, we do. Uh, the Nature Project, we give tours three or four times a year. Okay. Um, we post them up on our Facebook page yeah. when we're holding them. Um, I do lots of tours. I, I, I do uh, uh, several different tours of Northampton. So I do a medieval Northampton tour, but I also do a civil war tour of Northampton. Um, and the importance of Northampton to the civil war is often overlooked because when King Charles raises his standard at uh, Nottingham, Parliament raises its standard at Northampton. Yeah. And the army assembles there and from there they obviously go off to Edge Hill. And uh, you're, like I said earlier, you're heavily involved in the preservationist, particularly the battle of uh, battlefield at Naseby. Yeah. So, what sort of work have you been, you guys, been doing there to try and highlight this very important place? Well, I, most of the work's been done. Yeah. Uh, the, the Naseby battlefield project, as it was, it's, we've now renamed it Naseby 1645. It's been in existence for twelve years or so, uh, a bit longer. Uh, and so they they had already done uh, a form metal detecting survey of the battlefield so we know where every musket ball is every carbine ball is uh, and everything else as part of it that so we have studied as much as we can on the battlefield but there, there are still things that turn up and there are still new bits of research which we which we can find so it's all about making sure the battlefield stays as it is and educating people about it yeah that's right because again it's so important yeah um, so anyway mike thank you very much um all i what i will do is i will leave all the relevant links to mike's website books um facebook page go and support battlefield preservation is important you know it's part of our history it's part of everyone's history and again again it's education and learning about it and the english civil war is overlooked i think because it's so important yeah. as far as democracy is concerned um but yeah so anyway thank you for coming and tell us about the battle of naseby and hopefully we'll speak again soon cheers yeah, my pleasure thank you